This is Jumpstart, and we are very happy and honored to welcome today Sheikh Hamza Zorzas, who is the CEO of Sapiens Institute for Islamic Thought and Education and the former CEO of AIRA. He's been a Da'ya for over 15 years all over the world. He's currently a PhD candidate in religious and theological studies at the University of Cardiff. He's also the author of The Divine Reality, God, Islam, and the Mirage of Atheism, and several other papers and articles. He's here with us today. Welcome to Aman, and welcome to Aman Afam. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Jazakallah for the opportunity. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullah wabarakatuh. So let's get right into it. Uh, let's tell our listeners a little bit about who you are. You're from the United Kingdom. Yes. Or, and you have Greek origins. Yes. And you converted to Islam. You were not raised in a Muslim household. You, in the early 2000s, found Islam and became Muslim. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So I was born in London. I was brought up in an area in London called Hackney. And my father is Greek, he comes from Greece. My mom is Greek Cypriot, she comes from Cyprus. They both came to the UK in the 70s. And I was brought up in a very interesting household. Humanist, spiritual type of household. Not really believing in religion from the point of view of, you know, having a formal doctrine or religious ideology yes you know we have an orthodox greek background but my father was spiritual more than religious and i was brought up in an environment where my dad encouraged thinking and reflecting and engaging with other ideas and other peoples and that facilitated me thinking more about the key questions in life and I became a Muslim in 2002 I think it was October the 5th, 2002 And there were a few reasons why I became Muslim I think three main reasons Number one, I was intellectually convinced in the intellectual foundations of Islam Namely that God exists Namely that the Qur'an is from God It's an inimitable, matchless text And that provided the foundations for me to be at least convinced intellectually and then there was a kind of moral or values alignment Naturally from my fitrah In the Arabic tradition Fitrah means your original normative innate disposition So my innate disposition was aligned to The kind of social values And the moral values in Islam And that was quite attractive for me It was I was attracted to the moral values And and the social values of Islam So that was the, the second reason The third reason was an existential one Or at least a phenomenological one Meaning, you know, my first personal experience of the reflection of death I felt that was very important Well, retrospectively, obviously it was very important But during the process of it It, it made me realize that this abstract intellectual Stuff that you've been investigating concerning the veracity of Islam, the truth of Islam Has implications And it made the abstract stuff more real So, you know, if the truth of Islam was in my mind if Reflecting upon death or the implications of death It allowed it to enter my heart so in actual fact, the night before I became Muslim, my friend, uh, I was in his car and he gave me this very powerful understanding of the finitude of life and that death is an inevitability and the implications of death. And the way he described it was quite profound. I don't even really remember much, but I remember the feeling. And it was very expressive and it was very profound. And that made me take seriously what I knew in an abstract sense And that the whole process of reflecting And that first person experience of reflecting on the implications And the reality of the finitude And the contingent nature of what it means to be human I was like, I need to take this stuff seriously, right? And then I, then I went to the Regent's Park Mosque The London Central Mosque 
on a, I think it was it was a Saturday, October the fifth, two thousand and two, and I became a Muslim. And ever since then, it's been a very interesting journey. So those I think were the three main reasons. Obviously, I'm not the same person I was twenty years ago. I'm forty two now. I became Muslim when I was twenty two. I just turned twenty two, and it's been a very interesting journey. And I've learned a lot, and I'm very grateful that Allah has given me Islam because in a, in actual fact in the grand cosmic scheme of things you know faith iman having conviction in the truth of islam the fact that allah is the only deity worthy of worship worthy of our utmost love worthy to be known worthy to be obeyed and that we must direct our internal and external acts of worship to him alone this is reality and acknowledging it and internalizing it and actualizing it in your life is in the grand cosmic scheme of things, a huge favor, it's a gift. Allah says, God says in chapter 49, verse 17, about the people who thought that faith was a favor to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah says, you know, say to them, Iman is a favor to you from Allah, it's a gift to you. So I do appreciate that this is a undeserved priceless gift. And I'm also engaging in work where we're calling other people to this gift. So it's a compounded gift, right? I wanted to talk to you yeah. about that. You did mention right now that you converted when you were 22. Mm -hmm. You didn't, uh, m many people who embrace Islam spend a lot of their life finding their own personal journey. Now, you were very young and you didn't just look for your own journey but you decided to do more research you decided to write more yes and you decided to go out into the world and help people find their way yes. to islam and forward after they embrace islam what what was the uh, how did you decide that i don't just want this for me but i want this for as many people as possible what made you take that first step towards researching more and then conveying that message to other people yeah i mean to be authentic with you my motivations changed over the years that's for sure <laughs> where did it start how is it now well it usually starts with maybe a sense of ego right you just want to prove to the world that you're right everybody else is wrong and that's the nature of the ego and that's what islam teaches us not to be this is the this is the shaitanic way of being right because satan is uh one of our greatest teachers because he teaches us how not to be, right? So his disbelief was what you call based on kibr, a high level of arrogance. He was told to bow down to Adam and he was basically, he rejected God's commands, right? He said, no, you know, ana khairun min, I'm better than, I'm better than him because I'm made of fire, he, Adam's made of clay, right? So. He thought he was better. He he wanted to look good. He didn't want to look bad. He wanted to impose. He didn't want to be imposed upon. So he didn't want to bow. He wanted to be right. He never wanted to be wrong. Meaning, in this context, he thought God was wrong. Why 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 are you telling me to to bow down? You're wrong. My perspective is correct. So he wanted to be right. Never wanted to be wrong. He wanted to impose, not to be imposed upon. He wanted to look good, not to look bad. To the degree that he gave up the truth or he rejected the truth to the degree that he gave up the right way of being. And so when you're young, you're in your 20s, generally speaking, sometimes you just want to do that, isn't it? Your nafs, your egotistical drives are saying like, hey, prove the world wrong, prove yourself right. So that was the initial motivation. But like with all human beings, we have a cocktail of motivations, right? And one of the motivations was as well, from if I you know could remember all the way back, two decades ago, was also, you know, I feel this is true and it's a good thing. And, and naturally, as a human being and the way I was brought up, I'm going to share what I believe to be true, right? You know, sometimes we talk, the World Cup is happening now, we talk about soccer and we want to debate who's better, Ronaldo or Messi, right? And then there may be a discussion depending what your kind of uh, football or soccer affiliation is or what your perspective is. And we'll have a debate on that particular issue. But when it comes to man, life and the universe, your, your raison d'etre, your reason for existence, that's far more serious than believing who's a better football player, right? So this, this gift I just want to share with others as well. It's a natural thing. And human beings, as children, would like to share. Like, you know, when you have children and a child, you know, five-year-old sees a spider, what does the child do? 
Baba, Baba, there's a spider, right? You're supposed to share that information, right? So human beings have a natural affinity to want to share things that they believe to be true or they find fascinating. So that's another drive. But as you develop spiritually, you start to realize that, you know, this is a serious bit. <laughs> this is serious stuff, right? Mm. We're talking about the Akhara, which is eternal. You're talking about answering key existential questions that have that have plagued the minds and hearts of human beings since the beginning of time. Who am I? Why am I? For whom am I? Right? Whose am I? Right? These are big questions. Why am I? Yeah? So Islam answers these questions in a very profound spiritual and intellectual way that has a strong intellectual foundation, but also it makes sense to, to, to the heart, not only to the mind. And you know, you want people to have this goodness because a sign of a Muslim is that they want goodness and guidance for all people. In actual fact, the definition of being loving is to want to, you are committed to the well-being of other people. And from an Islamic spiritual perspective is that I'm committed to your goodness and guidance. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, upon whom be peace, said, you know, love for humanity where you love for yourself. Because there is a tradition that mentions linnas for the people. This is narrated by Bukhari and it's in Tariq Al-Kabir. And you have other similar traditions, I believe in Musnad Ahmad and other places. And we know the famous hadith collected by Anawi, the famous scholar, uh, you won't truly believe unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. But this brotherhood, according to the commentary of An Nawawi, the classical scholar, he says this also includes insania, humanity, from the perspective that you're committed to their goodness and to their guidance. Just imagine that for a moment. I want the audience just to think about that. Imagine your way of being when you're interacting with human beings on a day-to-day -day basis is that you are authentic and organic and naturally oozing out the commitment to other people's well-being. Isn't that, wouldn't that change the whole world? That, that's why the Prophet was a rahmah, a mercy to all the worlds. He was committed to the goodness and guidance of all people. Anyway, so the point is you want that for people and, and, it, and it defines who you are as a human being, but also just the reward aspect, the divine reward aspect of sharing this amazing message. It's just uh, incalculable, incalculable. You know what I'm saying, right? So early morning uh, tongue twisting there. But you get the point. It's, it's, it's innumerable. You cannot calculate it. It's exponential in terms of the divine reward. So that's another motivation. And so a lot of it is human driven, humanistic driven, meaning you want good for other people. So you want other people to, to, sh to, to appreciate that beauty. Like imagine it, I, I have a, you know, a very sweet taste in mango, right? And I love this mango. Like Pakistani mangoes are some of the best mangoes in the world, the honey mango, yeah? And when I have that mango, it, it's like, wow, this is like, imagine the mangoes in paradise. But anyway, so if I'm having really sweet mango, you know, I like you, you should want to share it with other people, right? So they could taste that sweetness as well. And what's interesting, if you've had that sweet mango and no one else has had it, and the whole world is telling you it's bitter, you're not going to take them seriously because you've actually really, you know, in the Islamic tradition, this is haq uh, al This is, you know, true by virtue of me experiencing it, yeah? Um, and you want people to, to, to have that sweetness as well. And at the same time, if people reject that it's sweet, it's because they haven't tasted it. But it's not going to lower your conviction because you've actually experienced it in a way that no one else has. Okay. Well, let's uh, talk to our listeners a little bit about what sweetness they can taste yes here. let's do that let's give them that mango yeah. let's give them the mango now <laughs> you have three talks or lectures which are being given yes at the sultan qabus grand mosque on the first second and third of december thursday friday saturday each one is a completely separate lecture from the other two yes so i'd like us to go over each lecture what people can expect from showing up to this what they will hear about you of course you'll be going into a lot more detail then but it is open for muslims and non-muslims to come to these lectures and it's going to be at 7 30 p.m on all those dates let's start off with the first one the way of abraham why allah is the only deity worthy of worship can you tell us a little bit about this one yes so the way of abraham is essentially seeing the creator of the heavens and the earth as the king, the master, the owner, the maintainer, the sustainer. 
of everything that exists and to appreciate that he is the only deity worthy of our worship and what does worship mean because people think worship is just like just doing an an action like lighting a candle or just praying but worship is a very profound concept in the islamic tradition it means that you know god you recognize god the most you want to know god the most right the god is the ultimate truth for you which is interesting because in, in the islamic tradition one of god's names is al-haq he is the truth another aspect of worship is that you love him the most he is al-wadud. He is the most loving. He is the source of love. I mean, how can you love things and not love the source of love? It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah? It's a bizarre situation. And and he's the most loving because we know God's names and attributes are maximally perfect. The, to the highest degree possible, they are transcendent. They have no deficiency in flaw. So just imagine the type of love that we're talking about. Like, you know, God is al-samad, meaning the independent. He's al-ghani. He is the free. And he loves, yet he gains nothing by loving. Imagine how pure his love is. Like a mother, she loves. We know it's unconditional, but it completes her. There is a contingency to her love. It completes her. She cannot not love. Right? God gains nothing by loving, but he loves. And the purity of that love is something else. It's just like mind-boggling. I mean, you can't really uh, square that circle. But... So we, we should love God the most And we'll unpack that And we should obey Him Because He is the ultimate authority I mean if you can ob obey a pilot When the pilot says Sit down, buckle up There's going to be turbulence I mean I'm not going to be so arrogant And start moonwalking on the aisle right, And start dancing right? No I'm going to sit down I'm going to buckle up I'm going to pray I'm going to make dua I'm going to say you know we, we, yeah, I don't like turbulence right? So we, we obey doctors Because we, we know they're an authority in their domain They say you have this illness Take this medicine Okay no problem I hear and I obey You don't take the medicine And you start analyzing its chemical compound You don't put it under a microscope Or whatever the case may be And No you just, you just submit to an authority If we can submit to authorities On a day to day basis Even as atheists Even as people who are not religious We submit to authorities Because we have epistemic limitations We have cognitive limitations We don't, can't know everything So we have to by virtue of that Because of that Obey others Or refer to others What about Allah? He's the ultimate authority He is Al-Hakim Al-Alim He is the knowing He is the wise God has the picture We just have the pixel Right? So by virtue of that Of course we're going to obey Him So that's a form of worship and we must direct all acts of worship to God alone. And these include ultimate gratitude and, and extensive praise. And ultimate gratitude and extensive praise is expressed through the acts of worship like prayer. And fasting and giving charity and so on and so forth. And one would argue, you know, we have to give God ultimate gratitude and extensive praise because God is Al-Khaliq. He is the creator. He created everything. All, he is Al-Bar, the greatest benefactor. All benefits and goodness that we, we receive in life is ultimately as a result of God. So we should give him gratitude. But there's something even more fundamental. There is something in our lives that we don't earn, own or deserve, but is freely given to us at every single moment. And that's every conscious moment. Every conscious moment we don't deserve, own and you know we're not responsible for. right? And we can't even earn it. Every conscious moment. So if it's true, and we know it's priceless Because if I said to you you had 10 conscious moments left 10 minutes left in your life But in order to receive another 10,000 minutes You have to give me all of your wealth Bismillah, you'll give me all of your wealth And you'll take someone else's as well Just to, just to be sure, right? That's how priceless life is Well, if it's true we receive this priceless gift That we don't earn, own or deserve Then how should it make us feel? We should be ultimately grateful Grateful to God And that's, that's, a, that's like a key to worship and another aspect is extensive praise. If you could praise Ronaldo and Messi for being great football players, right? We could praise poets like Iqbal for, for you know, producing great poetry or Rumi for producing great poetry. Or we can praise an engineer or an architect or praise other people by virtue of their attributes, even though their attributes are limited and flawed in some way. Then what does that mean about praising Allah? Whose names and attributes are perfect Allah is Allahu Akbar He is greater Not the greatest, He is greater Anything you can think about, Allah is greater So we could think the engineer What about the one who created the engineer? We could think the mind of a scientist What about the one who created that mind? Right? Yes. We could be in awe of nature But what about the one who created nature? 
right? We could be in awe of beauty. What about the one who is the source of beauty, right? We forget that, and Islam teaches you how to think that way. We don't just stop, right? You know what's in front of our noses. We we go beyond. We think. We see the implication. We understand. That there's something greater behind all of this I mean when you look at the stars For God's sake I mean Look at the universe Look at the The solar system Look at the Micro universe within yourself Right And the macro universe Externally Just even reflecting On all of these things In a deep way Will lead you to the conclusion That there is There is a Creative power Behind all of this and if we praise these things, then we should praise the one who created it in the first place. So God is worthy of extensive praise, and that's a and and that encourages, that's manifested in acts of worship through your tongue, through your heart, through your limbs. Um, so that's one of the, that's essentially that's why you know God is is worthy of, of worship. But I just want to just get people to think about something, and I think it's going back to the original point I made, which is. I don't know if I mentioned it, but let's just bring it again. That we're in a state of worship anyway, even if you're religious or irreligious, right? There is something that you know. Yeah, I've mentioned this that you want to, that you love, that you obey, and that you direct acts of worship like praise and gratitude towards. That thing is your object of worship. So, it, what Islam comes to do is to free you from the shackles of self worship or worship other things, worshiping creation. To worshipping the one who is worthy of worship The creator Because even if you're an atheist You're worshipping something If by worship we mean Loving something the most Knowing something the most Obeying something the most Directing acts of worship Like extensive praise And ultimate gratitude Towards something the most That's worship And 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 you therefore you worship something in your life It could be your own ego It could be an ideology It could be um, a statue It could be an idea It could be yourself It could be other people, it could be objects, it could be materialism, who knows? The thing is, you're directing, you know, acts of worship like extensive praise and gratitude and obedience and you wanted to know it or you recognize it the most and you love it the most to things other than God. And Islam came to free you from that because if you worship God, that's where true liberation lies. As, you know, God says, well, in the Quran, the word for soul is ruh, so, uh, is ruh, and that shares the same root as the word raha, which means liberty and ease. And it's as if the soul would only achieve that liberty and ease if it worships the one that created it, right? Which is very interesting because the Quran makes a very powerful argument in chapter 39, verse 29. Consider the situation of two people. One man is a servant to many masters and they're all quarreling. And one man is a servant to one master Whose condition is best So it's as if God is trying to say to us That look, if you don't worship the one that is worthy of worship That knows you better than you, than you know yourself That has more affection for you than your own mother Then you're going to be worshipping other things And they're all quarreling And they don't know what's good for you, right? And you're going to be in a state of existential angst Yeah And if you're not in a state of existential angst you're gonna you're in a state of existential drunkenness because you haven't thought about these questions, which is even worse, right? So, uh, Islam liberates you from that, and it liberates you from the shackles of uh, self worship, worshiping others. And this reminds me of, and I end on this, a line of of poetry from Iqbal, uh, the poet of the East. He says, "This one prostration, prostration to God, right? This one prostration frees you from a thousand prostrations, right?" Which is very very beautiful because you know if you're worshiping God, then you're not worship, you're not worshiping other things. But if you're not worshiping God, you're more likely to be worshiping other things, which includes even your own ego, other people, ideas, ideologies, materialism, whatever the case may be. There you go. And uh, you, I think you've connected that beautifully to your second lecture, which you're giving at the Stankabus uh, Grand Mosque on Friday, which is no good, no God, no good. Why religion matters, and I think that you may have answered quite a few. Or alluded to several of the points that would be made during uh, that. Example. Yeah, the no good, no good one is basically to show that the more you know God, the more you're going to know what good is. And if there is no God, there is no good. So it's a play on words, right? Because no in terms of knowledge and no in terms of the negation, right? So if there is no God, there is no true good in terms of objective morality. Yeah, And if you know God, 
then you're going to know what good is. So essentially what this lecture is going to be un unpacking is that every single one of us, or most of us at least, we believe in a sense of objective morality. So we believe morals are external to the human mind and human emotions. It's not just based on our own limited perspective. We know that killing a five-year-old is objectively morally wrong. Even if the whole world were to come and say, no, it's the right thing to do. Even if there were no human beings on earth, it's still immoral, right? So it's mind independent from that perspective. So if morals have this objective feel to them, or at least some morals have an objective feel to them, then how do we explain where they came from? What are their source? And how do we explain that they are mind independent? The only foundation for this, and in philosophy it's called a ontological foundation, the foundation for, the, for objective morals can only be God by virtue of who God is. You can't say it's evolution because it, it, it does not explain its objectivity. You can't say it's consensus of social pressure because that doesn't explain its objectivity either. And we unpack why that's the case. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is, yes, we have a natural understanding of certain things with regards to how we should live our lives the underlying basic moral principles. We believe this is fitri in all humans, religious or non, or not religious. We have this innate understanding, right, of the basic kind of moral principles. But in order to live a truly holistic good life, that can only come from the Creator because He knows us better than we know ourselves. He is al-bar, He is the source of all goodness. He is Al-Alim, Al-Hakim. He is the knowing, the wise. He has the totality of knowledge and wisdom. He has the picture. We have the pixel. He's got the moral picture. We've got the moral pixel. So when in God's commands, when he commands things that are in line with his nature, in other words, his names and attributes, he is the source of goodness. He is the knowing. He is the wise. And the argument here is that knowing God and, and connecting to him and obeying his commands is what living a good life is. And this is in the realm of moral epistemology. How do we live a good life? What is good? What is bad? And we would argue that yes, there is a natural basic moral principle, moral principles that we that we will agree with as human as humans, irrespective of religion or, or, or not. But to truly understand the way to live a good life is to refer to God's commands. And we're going to focus on why that's the case. Okay, very well. Now, the third and final lecture which will be given is the divine reality. Why atheism is irrational and unnatural. Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's a controversial controversial uh, title. I can tell, yes. yes. I'm looking at it. Uh, what, the first question that came to mind is, why this title? I mean, it's, yeah. we, we want to be authentic. I mean, Yani... I mean, from the perspective of being a, a Muslim, that you know, you believe it has Islam has an intellectual foundation. You believe Islam is true. Well, by virtue of that, obviously, you're going to believe other things to be rational, right? Because if it wasn't the case, then you would accept them. So let's be authentic about it. You know, as Allah says in the Quran, only a fool will reject the way of Abraham, <laughs> right? It's imprudent. Let's use that language instead. It's a little bit more polite, I guess. It, and I do believe it's imprudent. And it doesn't mean that the person who adopts such a position is is imprudent in totality. But maybe there are some blind spots that they're not aware of. And we need to unveil them to awaken the truth within. And when it comes to atheism, I mean, I think anyone who has been given the time to reflect on this question would not really be an atheist anyway in a strong sense maybe at best they'll be an agnostic yeah it's very hard to be an atheist in in a strong sense but when we're saying you know atheism is irrational one one of the reasons why we mention this is because atheism as a perspective cannot even justify our rational faculties like we agree in when we have discourse when we engage in munadhara in debate and discussion that we, we are both human beings with rational faculties. We have an ability to, de to deduce, to infer. We have a rational insight. Yeah? Basira. Insights. We have rational insights. Whether we're religious or irreligious, we believe we have cognitive faculties. The question here is, well, can we trust those cognitive faculties? And can we trust that they lead us to the truth under atheism? Because generally speaking, most atheists, not all of them, but most atheists, whether consciously or subconsciously, explicitly or otherwise, 
believe in something called philosophical naturalism, which is there is no God. Fair enough. Obviously, they're going to believe that. And they believe that everything in the universe can be explained by physical processes. And there is no non-physical, there is no supernatural. That's the general belief of a philosophical naturalist. And most atheists would agree with those points, at least most of those points. Under philosophical naturalism, you cannot explain your rational faculties. Right? Because physical processes are blind. There has no intentional force behind them. They're non-rational. Right? you got an electron whizzing around. Now you combine that together. How do we develop the ability to have rational insights? When we take two arguments, we take premises in our minds, or we take certain uh, assumptions or postulations or statements, we take them and we take them on a rational journey in our minds and we form a rational insight, we form a conclusion. How the hell is the mind doing that if the mind was based on fundamentally blind, cold, physical processes, electrons that's whizzing around? With any in, and no intentional force With all due respect To believe you have rational faculties That could give you truth but Under philosophical naturalism Is believing in magic Yanni. <laughs> let's, be, <laughs> let's just be honest man It's like taking a stone And touching it And you think butterflies are going to come out yeah, and let's be honest. I mean, there's nothing else to say. Now, we can unpack the theophilosophical discourse here, going to things like physicalism, functionalism. We can do that. This is my, you know, I have three postgrads in philosophy. We could go into that. But let's keep it simple. This is a simple way of doing it. Not only that is it irrational, it, it denies who you are as a human being. Do you believe you're conscious? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Habibi, are you conscious? Speak to people. Are you conscious? Yeah, Habibi, who's the one speaking? Do you have... Inner subjective conscious states When you have that sweet mango that we spoke about You have an inner subjective conscious experience When you say I love you to your wife or to your loved ones That love is a conscious experience It's an inner feeling, it's a state, correct? Right? It's not just having too much chocolate It's not just serotonin There's something going on, right? You have an inner subjective conscious experience This is a first person fact We all have conscious experiences We all have subjective conscious experiences so how can you explain consciousness under philosophical naturalism, as under atheistic philosophical naturalism? Everything is reduced to physical processes. Physical processes are blind, ya habibi. They're blind. They're cold. What, is it, what does cold mean? They're not aware of themselves. They're not aware of anything outside of themselves. In the language of philosophy, they have no intentionality. They, they're not about or of something. So how can you have blind, cold physical processes and consciousness emerges? Be consistent. At least say we're robots, Yani. You can't have your cake and eat it. If you believe you're rational and you're conscious and you reflect on this, I'm telling you it's impossible to be an atheist. Impossible. Just by virtue of this. Take another cold stone. Rub that stone. Rub it, rub it. Our butterfly is going to come out. Rub it more. <laughs> Sprinkle something. Do something with it. Nothing's going to happen. And that's... A very simple but powerful analogy to show that when you have blind, non-intentional, physical forces and processes that are cold, they're not aware of themselves, aware of anything outside of themselves, how can consciousness arise from that? Yes. I love how many mangoes you've just lobbed at me with your yeah. passion. So I do yeah. apologize because this gets me excited. It's like, come on, see. man. How can you be yeah. an atheist? Yeah. yeah. Well, now, don't get me wrong, by the way. I just want to be fair and just to the audiences yeah. that may have an affinity towards atheism. I do appreciate that religion doesn't have a very positive public relations. I do appreciate that sometimes we don't have an opportunity to talk out and think about these ideas. I do appreciate that people are atheists for many different reasons and not necessarily philosophical or theological reasons. So I do appreciate that not ev everyone is different. As Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, the third chapter, verse 113, I think it's 113, um, people are not the same. So everyone's different. I don't want to otherize thinking there is a group called atheists and they're all the same. I don't want to be like that. The reason being, because that's what they do with Muslims sometimes, yeah? Muslims, they're a monolith. They're all nasty. They're all the same. That's not the case, right? Everyone's different. So I do appreciate that people would have different motivations. But come to the event and let's explore it. And, you know, I like to consider myself as an authentic, loving type of human being. That's how I was brought up, generally speaking. And authenticity means here that you don't have any undeclared negative intentions. And love here means we're committed to your well-being. So hopefully when you come to the event, you will feel that. I hope so too as well. I, uh, I was actually going to lead to that next, which was why people should show up to the event. But I'm sure that they have gotten the answer for those who are willing through everything yeah, so we've if, spoken about. Yeah, so if any...
people with atheist persuasion come, I'm more than willing to spend time after the event, spend time with them. I'm going to bring a few copies of my book. They can have a free copy. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to engage. That's Hamza Andreas Dortis, who is the CEO of Sapiens Institute for Islamic Thought and Education, former CEO of AIRA. He's been a Dahlia for over 15 years. He's a PhD candidate in religious and theological studies at Cardiff University. And of course, the author of The Divine Reality, God, Islam, and the Mirage of Atheism, and several other papers and articles. And he's giving these three speeches at the Sultan Qaboos Grand Mosque, and it's being uh, sponsored by the Diwan of the Royal Court and the Sultan Qaboos Higher Center for Culture and Science. We do urge you to go find out more, whether you are Muslim or not Muslim. The doors are open for everyone. And that again will be happening on the 1st and 2nd and 3rd of December. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.